you're new here, welcome to the channel. Um, this is mainly a book and sciencey channel. And even though I haven't been putting a lot of book content out there, rest assured they're gonna come because miraculously somehow I have been able to balance both um, reading and my academic duties. So there are definitely some stuff which I'm planning on putting out there, um, particularly regarding some classics. So I hope you look forward to that. I won't say which ones because I wanna finish the damn book and then make, you could say, the review about it such that it's out there and I don't promise something that won't be delivered. So stay tuned for that in terms of bookish content. Content, but now, but for the sciencey content, um, let's talk about some cosmology. So um, I have made a video very recently about book recommendations for cosmology, and in that I mentioned that cosmology is definitely one of my favorite topics in physics. But despite it being so, I haven't made much videos on it on this channel. Perhaps the most closely associated with it are videos from my journey to relativity, because those, especially the last one, tended to be about general relativity, which is a framework that is very useful when talking about cosmology but cosmology itself i've not done much on and honestly it's because it is something which i think about quite often so um not perhaps on a daily basis but very close to that so it is not you could say as novel in my mind um as any of the other stuff of which i make videos about and explain where it's like okay i've gone back to my textbooks or i read an article online that mentioned this very or i observed something that seems to have very cool physics or math and let me explain that such that I can kind of both explain it to you guys and teach myself something in that process. Um, but I thought, why not talk about my thesis project and in that fashion deliver some cosmology content to you guys. So I've teased you a lot, but what is cosmology actually about? So cosmology is a branch of physics or astrophysics, if you will, that deals with the study of the universe as a whole. And that sounds quite ambitious. That sounds like a very condescending thing. But honestly, it is one of the best definitions to have it. And if you want to kind of have an intuition as to how that is possible, um, you can think about the premise to which you may have heard in a lot of popular science content, and that is that when you look at a star in the night sky, you see it as it was a long time ago. Like, for example, if um, the star is 3.4 light years away from us in distance, it means that light from that star took 3.4 or 5 years to reach us. So it takes time for the light of that object to reach us, and as such, we see it as it was at that given amount of time. And things that are much further away from us on the order of megaparsecs and such, so very high orders of light years, it means that we look at them as they were much longer ago in the past. And this is very interesting for physicists or these branch of physicists known as cosmologists because it allows you to have a map of the universe as it was in its, you could say, very early stages. And by mapping that very accurately, you can create models which can kind of allude to how the universe will evolve, you could say, over time. Because these things, these changes happen over such drastic cosmic times. Um, of course, we cannot observe them in human scale and lifetime, but you can create very accurate models that can do this for you. And the reason this is also particularly interesting is because the more you look, the further you look in space, the more you look back in time, and this means making telescopes that are sensitive to very light of very large wavelengths, um, they are able to look further and further and further back in time. This is why things such as, for example, the James Webb telescope is quite exciting because it looks at, we could say, objects that are in the more infrared region of the light spectrum. And this is stuff that you cannot see with your naked eye, no matter how hard you try. But it is quite exciting. You can see old galaxies and old lights, things that are much further away from us. Um, um, and if you look at the spectrum of light, you go from like, the visible color spectrum to the more red end. You get eventually to wavelengths like radio waves and microwaves. And um, very interestingly, a thing that was discovered in, um, you could say, around the 70s or so, was the so-called cosmic microwave background radiation. This is this picture, which you see right here. And this very staticky picture um, is, in essence, one of the best evidences that um, physicists have of something like the hot Big Bang having happened in the past. Um, and what it is, is a picture of the universe as it was very much younger and when it consisted out of mainly plasma. So if you can imagine the universe to have been much more condensed, and this is something that can be justified because astronomers were discovering 
going much earlier already in the 1920s and so that um, things around us, all of which we observe, like galaxies particularly outside of us, they were moving away from us. And this means that if you wind back that process um, through manipulating the mathematics you need to describe this thing, which would be general relativity, to praying around with the mathematics, it means that you get a fabric of like space time that was eventually much smaller, much smaller and smaller and smaller. And that means that matter was eventually clumped together in a much denser state. Um, if you have that, that means that you have plasma. And in the very early universe, you had mainly very light um, elements, um, plasma of very light elements. So mainly you had hydrogen um, nuclei, which would be just protons whizzing around, um, and helium nuclei, so just clumps of two protons whizzing around, and perhaps a little bit of lithium and other lighter elements, but especially helium. Um, so if you have that and you have electrons also moving around loosely because it's a plasma, as the universe continues to expand, um, the volume of it increases. And as the volume of a container increases, its pressure decreases. So in that sense, the electrons could at one point be captured by the nuclei which were whizzing around. And that capturing of the electron to form atoms basically um, emits light. And that light which is emitted in a process, this is called recombination. Um, at recombination, you get this light that is scattered and the universe went basically from being this opaque thing, very bright, which you cannot, if you were say existing in this universe, you cannot look around because it would be just so bright all the time. It went from that to suddenly being clear and transparent as light could finally properly propagate freely. Um, and this is the picture of uh, this cosmic microwave background radiation or the CMB shorthandedly. And it is a stunning piece of observational cosmology or just observational astrophysics um, because it allows us to very carefully probe and test out theories about, um, you could say, the early forms of the universe. And now the question is, if you know so much already about the early universe and about its conditions, about how elements you could say form, then problem solved, right? Like, why are we still talking about this and why am I somehow doing my thesis around this topic? Um, well, problem is not exactly solved because there are three observational traits which the CMB poses, which are kind of, you could say, open questions and problematic, um, two of which I'm not, I will not be talking about because um, it is not exactly relevant for the thing I'm tackling, but it, it is also quite technical. Um, one of them is regarding something called the horizon problem. And that is that if you look at small patches of the CMB, so small little angular diameters, again, small little patches of about one degree wide or so, um, if you look at a lot of these on the CMB, then they seem to have roughly an expectation value for their temperature, which is roughly the same. So they have a mean temperature that is roughly the same in all of its patches. This is problematic because some of these patches could not be in causal contact with each other, or a lot of them could not be in causal contact with each other meaning that there is no way for, at least classically, these patches to have been, ever been in contact with each other such that you can get this nice distribution of temperature. And if you think about it, that is often what is needed, um, even with a little bit of classical thermodynamics intuition, or just with a little bit of logic, you could say, if you have a warm beaker and a cold beaker, the warm beaker, the only way the two, the warm and the cold beaker could somehow have the same temperature is by placing them in contact with each other or placing something that goes from one beaker to the other such that the heat can transfer from the one hotter beaker to the next slightly heating this colder beaker up and reducing the temperature of the initially hotter beaker and at some point you get that they have roughly the same temperature in something called thermal equilibrium um, if these patches of the CMB are not in causal contact with each other that means that they could not thermally equalize each other so that is a problem the original solution to this came in the form of the paper published by Alan Gould um, where he posited this theory of cosmic inflation. So using the recently developed back then framework of quantum field theory, where instead of describing particles as these point-like particles, um, you shift the framework to describing them as perturbations in these so-called fields. And I know it's like, why do physicists do this stuff to themselves? Why do they abstract the picture so much? What is the point? Um, it's a good question. But the point is that by describing um, these particles as perturbations in fields. So, so the framework being that mathematically, at least the way you describe then everything around us is by this grid 
and this grid could all have various values so you can imagine just a lattice grid filled with num numerical values and certain also transformation properties like certain ways of which you can shift from one grid or reference frame to another um, by having this grid layout um, you can say that an electron or any other elementary particle like some quark or something they are places, regions in this grid at which you have this clump of certain values. And by doing that, the benefit is that, especially when you want to calculate how these um, particles interact with each other, you can use this framework to very nicely predict a lot of very precise and rigorous theoretical things about them. So you can predict things about quantum interactions up to very high precision. The reason now Alan Booth applied this to the problem of cosmology is because he posited that the way at which these things of which we see in the CMB were somehow um, causally connected with each other was if the universe um, was, uh, was at one point or another extremely small in size, much smaller than we'd even see with the CMB, of course, um, but it um, expanded in a very exponential fashion. It expanded really fast. And when this took place, one didn't have the um, elementary particles that we know and see, but one had a fundamental, you could say, field where, from which eventually as the universe became um, big enough, this field kind of decayed into all of the particles which we know and love. Um, so you can think of it as if having one type of matter that eventually, as the universe continued to expand, kind of fell apart and became all of the other types of matter that we know of. This process is called reheating. So in cosmic inflation, you have this fundamental field called the inflaton field, um, and it has certain quantum mechanical properties which are very interesting, particularly it has these things called perturbations. Um, the main reasoning for it being that as the universe was very small in size, um, eventually you run into problems um, through just arguments of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Um, as you have a very, very small size, it means that your um, certainty in the position information about this field is increasing, so the momentum information about it is going out of whack. So you have a lot of perturbations happening at these very very small scales of the universe. These perturbations, these bumps in this inflaton field were then stretched out, um, you could say, to big proportions, to big sizes because of this rapid exponential expansion of the universe. And eventually, as the universe grew big enough, this inflaton field, of course, then decayed into all of the other particles, meaning that if you had bumps initially in this inflaton field, those were carried over to whatever particle content was produced um, at the early hot big bang, so when par actual particles that we know of were produced. And these bumps, these over densities, are things that you can pretty much trace back using observational techniques. So this is where it gets more practical, when you can actually use your telescopes and such um, to, in a very sensitive manner, look for these over densities. Um, because then you can kind of test your theories about cosmic inflation. And it turned out that Good's proposal, along with certain improvements that came along with it afterwards by Linda and other people, um, this very accurately um, predicted some things about the CMB, particularly some something called the angular power spectrum, where you see these certain peaks, which corresponds with the amount of matter content that um, was predicted to exist back then in the early universe. This corresponded nicely with other types of survey in astronomy, and as such, it gave cosmologists the confidence to stand behind inflation, even though there are still debates as to whether or not inflation should be the way to go to begin with. But that's a point for another video. So inflation works really well, especially at predicting things like that angular power spectrum, but there are other very clear predictions of inflation which um, cosmologists have not yet found. Observationalists and experimentalists have not yet found um, these things, even though it's clearly predicted by inflation. And this is a very rich area of research in general. And one of them is the so-called um, signs of something called B modes. These are traces in the cosmic microwave background radiation, which alludes to the fact that during cosmic inflation, 
you might have had gravitational waves that would have been produced. If you have all of these matter bumps, um, these matter bumps um, would correspond to some curvature of space-time. Similar as to if you've seen analogies with black holes, if you have black holes or any body with mass, it curves space-time according to this picture of general relativity. Well, similarly, in the early universe, you had these bumps, you could say, that um, caused these kinks in space-time, and these should have carried over even to the CMB, where you can see the light coming from the CMB to be polarized in some particular manner, which would tell you that, okay, it is polarized in a manner that a gravitational wave has passed through it. Cosmologists expect to observe, but have not yet observed. They thought they found it in the early 2010s with a BICEP2 experiment, but it turned out that their data was um, carried a lot of noise, and it was, I think, intergalactic dust or something like that. So they didn't discover the tensor bi spectrum, but it is still something that people really look for. And this is where my thesis kicks into gear. My thesis is primarily concerned with looking at these tensor perturbations in inflationary models, um, particularly a mathematical object that comes from this framework of inflationary theory, something called the co-moving curvature perturbation. And this is something which tells you about if you have a scalar field, be it the inflaton field in this case, if it has these bumps due to this Heisenberg uncertainty argument, then um, at some point, if the universe was small enough, at one point, these perturbations had a particular wavelength, which one says that they were in sub-horizon. But as the universe continued to expand, space-time also stretched out, and new perturbations uh, started getting much bigger wavelengths. And at some point, they are big enough at which one wavelength completely exits the observable universe or the so-called Hubble horizon. And at the point at which they make this transition from the universe as we see it to whatever is outside of the universe, then um, as they're outside of the universe, this is called the super horizon um, regime, um, things are quite uncertain. We do not know exactly what the physical description ought to be, or there are attempts, but they're not exactly, it's not ironclad, you could say, but the main rough approximation is is that it goes transitions from this quantum field to this more classical field situation at which it is more stochastic. But as the universe continues to expand, because it is more of a classical field, nothing pretty much happens to it anymore, at least as far as we are aware of with our models. So the universe continues to expand, and these modes, which were too large originally, are then eventually captured in this larger universe. So you would say that these perturbation modes enter the horizon again. So you can then pick up, you could say, traces of these early inflationary modes. Now, working within this sub and super horizon scale, and I'm particularly focusing on the sub horizon scale, so that primordial, you could say, quantum fluctuation, where doing this quantum field theoretic, you could say, work is very important. Um, I'm doing that particularly for multi-field inflationary models, as there has been recent developments in the last couple of decades where cosmologists think that instead of just looking at single field inflation, it might also be beneficial to look at multi-field inflation or even higher field inflation. Now, it may sound arbitrary as to why people just throw in given arbitrary number of fields. It wouldn't be wrong for taking that, but one of the most straightforward reasonings I can give you is that this gives certain properties and predictions naturally, especially multi-field inflation, that would be quite interesting and directly testable with upcoming experiments when it comes to cosmology. Particularly if you have these multi-field inflationary scenarios, if you carry out the calculations of getting the power spectrum from it, which involves, which is something that I'm doing right now, but for a single field, which is much better studied and much easier, but I'm doing it because I need to get familiar with this stuff and it's very intense graduate level material because it's quantum field theory, you need to do something called canonical quantization, really make that classical field quantum mechanical, predict these little bumps and see the amplitudes of which you expect to see these bumps. And from that, basically, you can kind of predict what you kind of see, be it on the CMB or elsewhere. Because these perturbations which were produced from the early universe eventually laid the bedrock for structure formation, like galaxies and stars that were eventually formed, the first stars and galaxies and galaxy clusters that were formed in the early universe were kind of cemented on the bedrock of this, you could say, early perturbation that happened and were stretched out to these um, cosmic proportions. Um, so by predicting these perturbations from quantum fluctuations, you can kind of predict how you'd expect 
for especially from large galaxy surveys, taking data from recent telescopes and such uh, that have all of these super cluster, you could say, information, you can kind of do something that is more of a statistical technique uh, called using a correlation function to see whether or not predictions from inflation match up with observation. Um, and predictions currently kind of seem to point that matter in the universe is homogeneously distributed at certain large scales. And because of that, if you do something like a two-point correlation, which just means grab two random points on this sample of the sky, um, they should be correlated by a somewhat Gaussian distribution. And this makes sense because if you could say the universe was homogenized at some point because of these very small scales with these perturbations, then you would expect a roughly Gaussian distribution. But certain inflationary models um, kind of allude to there being a non-Gaussian distribution. And especially with multi-field, this is immediately um, apparently the case. And this is quite interesting because looking for these things could allude to new interesting physics. Looking for non-Gaussianities is a big area, you could say, in modern both observational and theoretical cosmology research. So my thesis is focusing on trying to narrow down these non-Gaussianities for multi-field inflationary models by especially studying the sub-horizon regime, which is something which I'm very much looking forward to. It's going to both allow me to work on on these, you could say, very niche theoretical techniques, which eventually I would have to deal with anyways, while also learning about um, some of the numerical techniques like coding and programming and such that is needed to kind of create graphs about these models and also kind of explore a current um, new, you could say, area of cosmology. So for all of these reasons, I'm pretty much excited for jumping into this bachelor thesis research, and I hope I was able to also convey, um, you could say, the premise of the whole story to you. If you have any questions, feel free to let me know down below. I was considering doing something like a vlog as type of video. So maybe if you're curious about that, I can do it. But honestly, I might just be focusing on doing my thesis and doing a good job and that and let this be just the video that I make on it and just focus on the content of which I already have planned, which will be things like the bookish videos, which I am thinking of, which are already kind of the bedrock is there. And also I'm continuing with my road to quantum field theory as I have already filmed a video for that but i need to edit it basically so i hope to see you guys soon in one of those videos and yeah hope you enjoy your day and easter very soon or if it's already passed hope you enjoyed it um and bye bye